Could you even define healthy food today? Not many could easily. Given the unique individuality of the gut biome making a healthy food for one poison for another, on every healthy food diet today, there is a way to do it dirty. Keto, vegan, vegetarianism, done using packaged and processed foods without reading the label full of chemicals that you're eating, it's known as following a dirty dietary stream. Alternatively, eating clean, whole foods that you prepare and plan based on the nutrient density of them, most often grown recently requiring water and sunshine, has the opposite effect on the body. Remember the famous fit to fat to fit experiment with Drew Manning? He purposefully gained 40 pounds eating junk, meaning eating dirty imitation foods and processed products. That was the dirty keto. And then he then reversed it and resumed a clean whole diet food. Okay. The rule for healthy food that's plant-based is eat more plant foods and less foods made in a plant. When you're looking for fast and grocery store aisles are full of fake foods and wearing on the label keto approved or vegan friendly, it can be hard to remember that these are marketing terms. They feel like labels of approval to the unsuspecting consumer trying to make better choices. Enter my guest for this podcast. Where do we start? Where do we begin making choices ourselves and not perpetuating habits that we were taught for future generations? We've got some answers in this episode. I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to Flipping 50, where I address your top struggles and concerns, and I share what to eat, how to move, and how to change your mindset so that you can have the energy and vitality that you want, need, and deserve in this second and better half. My guest today, after a decade of teaching holistic health, Lisa Jensa could clearly see a need to gather in the kitchen with like-minded individuals. A new ecosystem is needed that organizes resources from health advocates, food producers, and farmers to influence the shift to conscious consumerism. Freedom Kitchen is a place to gather, to nurture, and to love. Liz Agenda is a business and health coach who's owned a wellness spa and co-founded a commercial kitchen cooking school. A dynamic change agent and business guru, she cut her teeth in the business world with GM and EDS, living or leaving a successful career finally with HP Hewlett Packard after 25 years in the fast-paced world of IT consulting to coach others on holistic health modalities. I'm going to give you right now the mic drop for the episode, even before I bring her on. Our freedom begins and ends in the kitchen. And you'll hear that again, just as a reminder. Let's dive in. Lisa, thanks so much for joining me. Oh, Deborah, it's my pleasure. Thank you. So we are unpacking a lot of things that are actually sound so simplistic and then are so complex. I mean, (laughs) generally speaking, there are a lot of listeners confused about what is healthy food. And it's no surprise given individual needs and media poking its nose where it doesn't belong. And how would you put into words the problem with healthy today. Yeah, I have to laugh because it it really is something that is so simple that we've turned so complex. And if we look at animals in nature, they don't second guess what they're meant to eat. We second guess because of our intelligence, because of our analytical mind and the amount of conflicting information that's been provided. So we live in the information age. (laughs) There's a lot of information and we think that there is one right answer for all of us. And there's just not, 
we're different and unique. And as a result of that, there's no single best answer for any one person. And unfortunately, Deborah, I think that we've been conditioned to look outside of ourselves for the answer as if our parents knew better, our teachers knew better, the government knows better, <laughs> our employer knows better. We've been conditioned to look outside of ourselves and we've lost touch with our innate wisdom. Wow, that was a mouthful right there. I'd like to say mic drop, but that was that was a little heavy to tell you the truth. Uh, mm-hmm. And so true. I mean, and that's why I think it's so heavy. And I've got a friend who would like to probably be listening to this and he would say, oh, so maybe I was meant to eat ho-hos and Twinkies. <laughs> and that's not true. <laughs> you know who you are if you're listening. <laughs> so, and we are, by the way, talking primarily to women, but sometimes my nosy male friends poke their heads in. So <laughs> yeah. let's let's address then the biggest question. And this is, it's always uh, the true or false questions that have these kinds of words in them that make you say, oh, red flag, red flag. But what's the best way (laughs) for an individual to choose their best diet? Yeah, there's only one way, Deborah. In all of my years of reclaiming my own health and then helping other people, the only way is an elimination protocol. Mm -hmm. And And I I read every diet book and and lots of research books. Um, I reversed type 2 diabetes, and it's something that runs in my family. So I've done a substantial amount of research on that alone. And I always tell people, listen, if there's a silver bullet, I will find it. I will be the one to find it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. But as of this point in time and 15 years uh, in doing this work, Uh, The only answer I can give is an elimination protocol, and it's not the answer most people want to hear because it does require time Mm -hmm. and effort and commitment. Let's lean into that. This is serendipity, literally. So about two hours ago, before I jumped on an afternoon of podcasting, I had a coaching call with someone who, you know, as is so true about the influence that midlife women have, she was asking for her husband and, you know, said he's having some issues and I suspect he's got some food sensitivities, but I don't think that I can get him to do the elimination diet. And is there a quick lab test he could do? And I said, well, yes. And It won't tell you everything. (laughs) And exclusively or alone, independently, it'll only take you so far. You really probably need to do both. I would love it if you would talk just a little bit about your own personal journey. So what was it that happened to you? Yeah, so I was 36 and had a health crisis. That's kind of the uh, the pinnacle um, of the health crisis, but it really started uh, as far back as I could remember. I bloated after every meal. Um, I had digestive issues. Um, I had I was constantly hungry. Never felt satisfied. Um, I overate to the point often that my stomach hurt. Um, but I was eating, you know, carbs and grains and clearly already had like issues with leptin and ghrelin and never felt satisfied or full, but those are all symptoms of gluten intolerance. So if I were to look all the way back, I had gluten intolerance as long as I could remember and lactose intolerance, dairy. So I had the allergy salute, had all the scratch tests on my back. No one ever figured out it was dairy. It wasn't until in my 30s I took dairy away. And for the first time in my life, my nose stopped itching and I stopped all the post-nasal drip. And so I had years and years of antibiotics because I was constantly suffering from a, a sinus infection. But, you know, at 24 years old, my uh, my wrists hurt so bad. They told me I was carpal tunnel and I was in wrist braces. At 26, my ankles hurt so bad that they said, just take Advil. My doctor told me just, you need to take Advil. I said, every day, my ankles hurt every day. Now at 26 years old, they were talking about carpal tunnel surgery and telling me to take Advil for the pain in my ankles as if the pain in my wrists and the pain in my ankles were caused by something different. Hmm. This is how our body 
system has been turned into different pieces and parts instead of being looked at as a whole. If that's not an example, a good example of how our medical system looks at us as only pieces and parts. So none of that was correlated with the food allergies, um, the digestive issues, my triglycerides were, were, they were over 150 at 18 and by 36, they were 300. Your triglycerides should be under 100, <laughs> like 75. Um, so there, were a, there was a lot going on, Deborah, and what it came down to were food intolerances and um, insulin management. And my, my body doesn't process grains and sugar very well, so I don't process, um, it, I can't process as many grains. I really need to be grain-free. So this is why I say we're all different. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, I'll just add, if someone told me that you can't have this or you can't have that, the natural rebelliousness would be to go have it. Like, don't tell me I can't have wheat or gluten. Now mm-hmm. I'm going to go eat 10 times as much. Mm-hmm. So there's this natural rebellious nature when we're told we can't have something. And what I like about the elimination protocol is that the person actually determines for themselves because they're the ones who feel that in their body. So then it's not someone else telling me I have to do that. It's me feeling it in my body. So I had people that told me that this was all in my head. And I'm like, no, actually, it's all in my body. I can feel the difference. (laughs) Yeah, so, so good. And that, I think um, I will use the same words as you. It's like, then it's not me convincing you, is what I'll say to a coaching client. You, No one should do that for you. You know, I will give you the blueprint you walk through and you'll determine you know, your body never lies. It's going to tell you the yeses or the noes. I so love that. So we got full circle a little bit. I mean, here you are now later and you're teaching cooking classes to kids. I absolutely (laughs) love. I'll have to tell you when I was in college, I spent my summers as a Midwestern Iowa girl. I spent my summers in Louisiana And I was director for a kid's camp. And part of my favorite thing was coming up with like the snack that I would make with the kids on a given day. It was so fun to watch them, you know, just go to town on just making an absolute mess, but getting their hands right in there and then loving eating, you know, their creations. It was so fun. How is it that you began teaching kids and that passion, where did it start? I, well, I have to laugh because I didn't grow up saying I want to grow up and be a health coach. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> so my path and my journey led me to this point and walking away from corporate America and then coaching a lot of women our age because I owned a wellness spa. And when I was approached about teaching uh, the kids cooking classes, I said no multiple times because I looked at it like an activity and I said, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a daycare provider. Like I, I don't think that this is the right fit for me. And um, I actually hired a retired teacher to teach the first year and then was sort of aghast at some of the things she was teaching them. Cause I thought, why, why would you teach anything with wheat or gluten? They, are, they can learn how to make that anywhere. Why wouldn't we teach them options? And that's when my eyes opened up to what was possible. And um, I had a mom come to me the very first semester that we were teaching. And she said, you're the answer to our prayers. And I still get teary eyed when I think about them. Her daughter had been diagnosed celiac. She was, she was um, not absorbing her nutrients. So they had already picked up on a number of the issues that I know I had as a child and had determined it was celiac. And she said, we're doing our best to go gluten-free, but we know she needs to learn how to cook. She can't always rely on other people to know how to prepare food for her. And when we found your classes advertised as entirely gluten-free, we knew this was the answer to our prayer. And I love that little girl, Riley, and she's left a mark on my heart. Hmm. And in the last few years teaching kids, I've seen that the kids are eager, willing, and able to learn what healthy means to them 
And we can teach so much in the kitchen about personal responsibility, critical thinking, decision making, and empowerment. My kids are learning to not only what to say yes to, but they're learning what to say no to. And that's powerful. That is so powerful. Yeah, I can I can remember being in the room with kids where, you know, maybe they had been taught, they'd gone to a a class or learned something about a food and then their parents would be in the same room and it would be the child making the parent aware of what they were doing. Love yes. that. Um okay. So you have a summit coming up. And the summit, first of all, is so much I want to what back here about. It's called the Fork in the Road. So I want to look at that. But is the summit for kids, for for those who support kids? Is it for adults? Tell me a little bit more about the nature of who who is like most likely to attend and love it. Yes. Um, a Fork in the Road came to me after working with these kids and realizing that it's time for us to make different choices. And the choice, I believe, comes down to the choice between convenience and creativity. So I do ask for the listeners to really kind of take that in because it's our generation that bought into the convenience mentality and lifestyle. I mean, we were sold a bill of goods. Um, I was the first working mom, you know, in my family. And so I fed my kids convenience foods and convenience foods have become very inconvenient (laughs) to our health. But what is the antidote to convenience? It's creativity. So kids love to be creative and we can allow them to get creative in the kitchen. And so many of us And, you know, I I think once we're empty nesters, we might enjoy getting back in the kitchen. But there was a period of time I know that cooking was a chore to me and still can be. It's not to the kids. It's so interesting because we think it's a chore. We actually tell them to get out of the kitchen and they actually find joy in the creativity of it. So there's, you know, different layers of this that I would, would ask everyone to consider in that choice of convenience to creativity. And in the the 50 plus, you know, my age group, we're empty nesters, but we're starting to have grandchildren. And here's what I hear from my friends. My grandchildren are, are so poorly behaved. They're nothing like my kids. My kids never behaved like that. This new generation, they don't listen. Well, I beg everyone to understand that there's more chemicals in use in our food and in our products every generation. And so these kids are born with over 200 chemicals in their cord blood. My kids, the testing at that time was around 100 chemicals in cord blood. We're now over 200. These kids are suffering. They're suffering from toxicity and nutritional deficiency, and we're not aware of it. So who is this summit for? It's for those of us in the 50 plus who who know that we can do better when we know better, we can do better. And maybe we can help change the trajectory of, you know, really what we help to create. (laughs) And um, I think it's for moms with kids who need to understand that the behavioral issues and health issues could be related to food. And I think it's for the kids so that they can take personal responsibility. And they do, Deborah. They really do when they're given the information. Yeah, I love that. I love it so much. And I I think the real nugget there is that as adults, we can often put on kids something that it really is never there. And we can maybe turn the tables and let them be the inspiration for, for us. Um, so love that. While you were talking, something came to my mind and it is actually a a, a leftover, um, I don't know what I call it. It's almost like a memory box thing that I've been given and it belonged to my grandmother, but it was a dish towel that is like threadbare that hung in her kitchen forever. And it's no matter where I serve my guests, they seem to like my kitchen best. You've probably heard it. Yeah. Yep. And, and so I think so true. And it's where kids congregate, you know, I don't know about anybody else listening, but I did all my homework at the kitchen table 
I'm yeah. as much as my mother wanted to kick me out of there. Like there's not room. We're trying to eat here, trying to try to get some stuff done. But um, I think it just goes to show that it's been at the root for all of us for a very long time. I love that. What's yeah. What's the urgency around your message yeah. right now? I mean, we're we're in a really tough time where I think, you know, especially for listeners here, many listeners identify with exactly what you said. Like I'm getting bloated after I eat every time. Like we wake up in the morning and, oh, my stomach's kind of flat. Well, that's when you're lying down flat, right? And then you get up and you start putting something in and it changes. They can identify with that. And so there are a lot of people potentially struggling with, you know, what I learned at one point was healthy, isn't potentially healthy for my body anymore. Where's the urgency in terms of our health and or future generations health? Yeah, it's frightening to me when I look at the statistics so, you know, just briefly, like 6.1 million kids with ADD, ADHD, more than 60% of them are on stimulant drugs. Those stimulant drugs um, have a very strong or high correlation to drug addiction later in life. So if you look at the number of kids and the number of them that are being put on stimulants, we're raising a generation of potential drug addicts where they are getting excitatory um, with the glutamate, gluten it is a, turns into glutamate and it's very excitatory. So that's causing dopamine, increased dopamine, which also then leads to addictive behavior. So, I, you know, I would say consider the culture with the amount of dopamine addicted things, you know, whether it's the like button on Facebook, how many likes did I get or the video games that they're playing, combine that with the gluten, the processed food, the MSG that crosses the blood brain barrier now you've got them on stimulants. This is a recipe for disaster. So we have one in six on the spectrum now. Um, that is at the trajectory that we're on. That is projected to be by 2030, like one in two. Dr. Zach Bush says 54% of all kids now are already in a disease process. Dr. Darren Schmidt just uh, was talking about a study that the insulin levels of 18-year-olds 90% of them are already diabetic and it's going undiagnosed, but they're already type 2 diabetic not based on their A1C, but their total insulin level, but the lipid panels are showing we're eating too much sugar. And I could go on and on, but you can hear the urgency in my voice. We have to stop this. We need to turn this around. And the way we do that is to let go of those convenience foods and get back in the kitchen, be creative, know the source of our food, become more conscientious and potentially even plant and grow our own food. And that's really what I'm bringing together are the resources for us to consider how do we make healthy swaps in the kitchen? What are my options? Empower the kids to cook for themselves and then start planting those seeds, pun intended, but start planting those seeds for them to grow their own garden or raise their own chickens or they have to know that that's possible. And, and I just don't know where that's being talked about, especially in our schools. <laughs> Yes. Oh gosh. And even in our schools, we could probably unpack that and say, look, let's look at, let's look at lunches that are served. Oh my goodness. Oh, yes. That's a whole nother conversation, but you yes. Know. yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not here to throw stones, Deborah. I'm not, yeah. and I don't want anyone to think that I'm being judgmental. I'm being observant. And mm -hmm. I raised my kids on fast food and junk food. And I was a working mom. We ate out seven days a week. And until I had my health crisis and we turned things around here. But um, so this is not coming from a place of judgment. It is coming from a place of observation and we're seeing empty store shelves. There's other signs that are telling us, wake up. We have to go back to growing our own food. We have to know where our food comes from. We can't eat the grass. We have a lot of grass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Okay. So much here that I um, I want to thank you for for everybody listening. I want to thank you for the work that you're doing because I think we can all get behind you enough to realize if we were going to fight this fight, this for you has to feel like swimming upstream much of the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So if we could throw you a line, if you can feel it virtually, um, there you go. 
because I think I I feel like you're fighting the fight for all of us and and not just for those of us who might be listening who still have young kids because many of us who who don't have young kids may have uh, grandchildren so there is that second generation or or what's coming later but even if you don't have children of your own looking at how we all either collectively win or or we don't by our awareness of food and pharma and what power we have in the kitchen and how we can improve it. So the summit is coming up. We're going to definitely put the link in the show notes. If you have a mind like a steel trap and you're listening, that is flipping50.com forward slash freedom kitchen, where you can go and get the link. But I also want to make sure then um, that, Lisa, tell me the dates for the summit and and kind of how the layout is. Yeah, so we did something a little bit different. We created a docu-series that is a four-part series because, let's face it, our attention spans are getting shorter (laughs) and we're trying to retain a lot of information. And so what we did is we put it together as a four-part docu-series that are only about 15 to 20 minutes each, because I know everyone's super busy, that will then lead into a summit where we have the full interviews. Um, I definitely encourage everyone to then get to those interviews, especially the people that they resonate with, make the time to listen to those interviews. We also have a number of wonderful coaches like yourself who did a cooking segment, and those are really important too. Because information can only take us so far, and I'm doing everything I can to make these events practical, where we can take someone to the next uh, to the next step, so they can start implementing change. Because nothing changes until we change. Hmm. Amen, sister. Okay, and it's small steps. So I guarantee you, you're going to learn some fun things. And listeners, so just so you know, yes, I'm just going to be the blender babe. That's what I'm doing. So many of you know me too well to know. No, I actually do like to cook. I like to get in there and I like it to be easy, but um, a blender is. And so I'm talking a lot about protein and and protein needs for kids and how it can actually um, support their growth, not just yours, but theirs. So what I'd love right now for you listeners is to ask me a question or leave a comment below the show notes. The show notes will be flipping50.com forward slash healthy food. Leave me the comment or you're going to want to come in, click here so that you can get to the Freedom Kitchen Summit, see what that's all about, see what Lisa's doing. And really it's a movement where maybe you're going to want to watch some of these videos with your kids or your grandkids, depending on the age appropriateness for them. It's, we're all in these different places right now. And um, this is really a way we can have a huge impact and influence on the future generations. I mean, what we put on our tables, what we're creating, and the impression we give about the ease of experimenting and trial and error, that none of us gets it right the first time out. So Lisa, again, thank you so much for the work you're doing and for being here. Oh, I so appreciate it, Deborah. I just really believe if we distill it down, our freedom begins and ends in the kitchen. There's one choice that we make every day, and we really need to become conscientious about who we're supporting with that choice that we make in our kitchen. So well said. That, my friends, was the mic drop for the day. (laughs) All right, listeners, what are you waiting for? Let's start Flipping 50 today.